Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Let's kick things off with a story about a couple's exasperating adventure with their SUV. Imagine taking your car to the dealership because it's acting up, only to be told a simple computer reset should do the trick. But surprise, surprise, the fix is anything but simple. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Since there's nothing wrong with it, you can buy it. My SUV was throwing error codes, so we took it to the dealership to have them look at it. They informed us the computer just needed a reset and everything was good. We didn't believe them, so when we went to pick it up, my husband drove it around the parking lot, and just as we suspected, it was driving awful and now making a horrible noise. So we went back inside and told them they're wrong and to fix it properly. Several days later, they called us back to say they figured it out and it was definitely fixed now. Something to do with the transfer case and a $2,000 bill later, we're told it's fixed and we won't have any further issues. Great, I drive it away and I get error codes again. By this point, we're beyond frustrated because this vehicle just keeps costing us money and is being nothing but issues for the past year or so. So we take it to the dealership and tell them we'd like to sell it. The lady evaluating us asks if there's anything wrong with it and I inform her that I just picked it up from your service department earlier today and they told us that it works perfectly. She takes the keys and goes out to look at it, comes back in and asks about flashing lights and some weird things. We agree with her and let her in on the story. We walk over to the service desk and inform them that their sales department won't buy it because there's something wrong with it, so why does the service department keep telling us that there's nothing wrong with it? He went so red and immediately went to speak with his manager. They ended up having to call the vehicle engineers to figure out how to fix it, and we only had to pay cost on the part that apparently would actually fix it. It was something to do with a computer, something that needs replacing after the transfer case goes. I can't say for certain if it was finally fixed or not, because the day I picked it up, I traded it in for a different make. It's funny how flat-out lies and underhanded tricks are an expected part of legitimate businesses when they should be illegal. And our second story. Boss from Hell Gets What She Deserves I, 30s female, have been a people pleaser to a fault my whole life. I've been working in marketing for 10 plus years. Over the years, I've had my fair share of bosses who were good, average, and some who sucked. There's one in particular who stood out as awful. This story's from about five plus years ago. Pamela, 40s, was the VP of marketing and sales for a mid-sized retailer. She started at the company a few years after I did, and if rumors were true, she was the fourth pick for the position and was simply hired so the company could appease shareholders. I was a manager under her and my whole job was to make sure the website and stores had their products merchandised properly, received all their monthly sales materials, managed advertising, set up and managed the department's budget, PM'd all department projects and operations, created reporting to reflect sales, managed presentations and creative briefs for future projects, etc. In short, I did her work and all the administrative grunt work to keep the department afloat. I managed all this because I had access to her email and many times sent emails on her behalf to keep the department functioning. Pamela spent most of her time showing up after 10 a.m., taking business lunches and planning company parties. Don't even know why we did those, but I planned those too. I consistently questioned why she spent so much of our budget on these events when we didn't have the budget for resources for any of it. Pamela told me to take from future month's budgets to pay for the current month's overspending. So at the start of every month, I had an original budget, and by the end of the month, I had to turn in an edited budget, edited under Pamela's direction, that made it look like Pamela's spending was under control. This is important for later. I definitely made mistakes here and there being in charge of so many tasks and constantly found myself working 12-hour days split between being in the office and working after my kid went to bed. Weekend work was also done before my family woke up and after they went to bed. During Pamela's first major holiday season, sales were crap. Pamela kept changing her mind on the visuals for the stores, kept bringing on new advertising and PR agencies to bring in sales. All these agencies consisted of her personal friends, 
and ignored our buying slash merchandise team's planned promotions for her own better ones. At this time, I'd been dealing with an ongoing infection that turned to sepsis and was hospitalized. The doctors and my husband said it was due to the stress of work and that I needed to take a break. As I recovered, I realized how much I was hurting myself, my family, and even the company I worked for. Eventually, my old habits got to me, and I got on my phone and checked mine and my boss's emails. What I found made my blood boil. First, I got a lovely bouquet of flowers from upper management wishing me well, and I knew that Pamela organized the delivery. She sent me her favorite flowers. I went to her inbox to put the receipt in the correct folder to send to accounting when I got back. At the top of her inbox from the past three days were emails clearly not related to business. What I found in her emails was Pamela emailing her personal friends griping on how I can't just shake off sepsis and get back to work. She also complained that she couldn't find any of my notes, spreadsheets, or documents for any of the work she was technically in charge of. They were on our shared drive, labeled very clearly. Finally, I found an email where she sent a friend from a previous company asking for advice on how to bring in sales and save her job. In this long thread, this old colleague asked if there was anyone managing most of the work, and of course Pamela said I was. The colleague explained that clearly it was my mismanagement that was causing issues and that I could be blamed if sales didn't pull through by the end of the season. Pamela mentioned that I was in the hospital and repeated comments from her other email thread, this person said that she couldn't outright fire me because it could seem like retaliation because I needed to take emergency medical leave. But if Pamela could prove I was stealing from the company or misusing company resources, then she would have grounds to have me fired and use me as a scapegoat. Upon my return, Pamela called me into her office and said she was worried I was taking on too much and wanted to take work off my plate. She announced she was taking managing the department budget off my plate. She asked me to only drop off a small stack of invoices to accounting. Additionally, Pamela told me under no circumstances was I allowed to talk to accounting about anything regarding budgets. Also, if I had any concerns about the department or workload, I wasn't allowed to go to HR. I had to discuss it directly with Pamela. Oh yeah, I can see where this was going. Unfortunately for Pamela, I'd built a rapport with Lois, 50s, who was our main accountant. Lois always said that she would do everything in her power to help me, should I ask. Knowing this, I grabbed the stack of invoices off Pamela's desk to give to accounting. I also added the email threads I read while I was in the hospital and the current unedited budget that Pamela hadn't touched yet for the month. I also found in my filing cabinet the hard copies of old budgets with Pamela's handwriting on what numbers to change to balance our budget. Finally, I added an email from our first round of budget adjustments where Pamela subtly threatened to put someone else in my job if I couldn't do what she asked. So I walked and dropped off the invoices to accounting when I bumped into Lois. She brought up invoices and I sternly looked at her and said Pamela is the only one in our department that Lois is allowed to talk to about our budget and invoices. Lois saw the suspiciously thick file folder on her desk, gave a firm nod, and lovingly kicked me out of her office. Within the week, Pamela was fired. From what I understand, she has been continually job hopping for the past few years. The CEO and HR brought me in to personally apologize for everything I went through and gave me a paid one-week vacation to take at my discretion. Given other issues with this business, I left after another year. Which brings me to today. I am, once again, a manager for sales and marketing. I have a wonderful boss, Mike, 40s male, who trusts my business decisions and backs me up on practically everything. We're hiring my team for me to solely manage and direct. Today, I looked through the applicants and found Pamela's resume sitting among dozens of others. I stared at her name, wondering how many other people share her name. Upon review, yep, it's her. She definitely fell down the corporate ladder, with VP of our old company being the highest title she earned. And to no surprise, she embellished her achievements, claiming the work I managed as her own, and claimed she generated 87% sales growth during the holiday season at our previous company. As a people pleaser who firmly believes in giving everyone a chance, it's never been so satisfying to click disqualified. Edit. To those suggesting I interview her to see her reaction, I would have loved to see her face as she walked in, but I felt it would have risked my boss's trust in my decision-making ability. 
Maybe I'll send a personally written rejection email. You did great at having all the evidence you needed to protect yourself after your former boss so arrogantly tried to throw you under the bus to cover her own butt. And our next story. Nurse said ginger ale was for patients only. Sitting in my wife's hospital room and a nurse asked if there was anything she could get me. I had a bit of a tickle in my throat and I was thirsty, so I asked for something carbonated. She brought me ginger ale. Great, problem solved. Next shift, nurse asked me the same question and I asked for a ginger ale. She brought me a ginger ale with no problem. Next shift, no problem. Then things get interesting. Morning shift comes in, this nurse asks the same question. I asked for a ginger ale. She told me those are for patients only. I had to go get my own. So I instacarted a ginger ale along with a few other things with instructions to deliver to the room. They were taking my wife away to surgery and the instacart shows up at the same time. He asks if anyone ordered groceries. I waved my hand up and asked him to leave it in the room. The nurse exclaimed, you can't do that. I told her, you told me I had to get my own, so I did. The sheer look of her head blowing a gasket was priceless. I really do love nurses. They're more important than the doctors, in my humble opinion. Patients have the most contact with them. I even keep treats in the room just for nurses. I've never met a nurse as militant or controlling or as much of a sheer BTH as this one. So I took a bit of pleasure here. What she didn't know is that I was a patient in this hospital for three and a half weeks back in January. I instacarted and door dashed orders with no problem. I could only eat so much hospital food. Some people are more strict than others. She may just be one of those people who tend to take hospital policy more serious. And our last story, a lawyer and his fence. A coworker told me this story a few years ago. This happened in early 2000. So we work as electricians. Once he had something to do at a lawyer's house, you can imagine a big house and a lot of property. Everything was really nice. Only on one side, there was a mound of earth, a long pile of dirt all the way to the property line. He asked said lawyer about it, and he told him that he hated that neighbor and had a 10-foot, 3-meter fence. Well, the neighbor hated him as well and had him tear down the fence since the community regulations only allowed 6.5 feet, 2-meter fences. Since he was a lawyer and a mad lad, he read the regulations, bought a lot of dirt, built this six and a half foot, two meter pile of dirt, and installed a six and a half foot, two meter fence exactly as the regulations required. That's what happens if a petty lawyer hates you. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.